Hi, my name's Kim Morrow and I'm an ordinary Hoosier. I am a single mother of two, um, one that walks earth and one that's in heaven. My oldest daughter, Amber, was born in 95. She had a huge personality. She was very caring and giving and she was always coming home and from school and telling me that somebody didn't have lunch money so she'd buy lunch for him and she'd go through her closets and get rid of clothes that she couldn't wear, didn't like anymore to some of her friends that she knew that she knew that they could use it. She loved kids. She, um, anytime there was kids around, she was, she was happy. She wanted to be a elementary school teacher. She was planning on going to Ball State after she graduated high school and uh, she wanted to be an elementary school teacher. She was um, very social. She loved to be around her friends and people and almost every weekend there was at least one of her friends here, if not more. She, um, she was just, she was a good girl. On October 28th, 2012, uh, Amber had told me that she was going to go stay with a friend the night before. And about two o'clock in the morning, um, she had made the decision to get into a car with a boy that had been drinking. And they were, they were going someplace and they were trying to beat a train and they ended up hitting the second engine of the train. It killed her and the driver instantly. And then there was one other passenger and he was lifelined and he survived. Um, one of my best friends had, had called me and she said, where's Amber at? And I said, well, she went and spent the night with a friend last night. And, she said, I just got this really weird text that he'd call you. And I'm like, well, what for? And she says, I don't know. And she says, let me call you back in just a minute. And I picked up my phone. I called Amber's number and she didn't answer. And she called me back and she says, you need to call the Farmland Police Department right now. And I'm like, why? And she says, you just need to right now. She already knew. And the phone call had woke Emily up. And I told her that she needed to go get dressed because I didn't know what was going on. So I was starting to panic and I was trying to call Amber's number and I couldn't get Amber to answer. And I'm like, I don't even know what firmly in part, you know, police department's number is. So I called my uncle and uh, he said, uh, he said, I'm on my way. He had just gotten off the phone with Amber's dad. I had just, I kept calling her number and kept calling her number. And uh, he pulled, my uncle pulls in the driveway, and by this time I had thrown clothes on, Emily had thrown clothes on. I told her, I said, I don't know if we're going to have to go to the hospital, I don't know what's going on. And uh, I met him at the back door, opening and unlocking the back door, and all he could say is, she's gone. And the only thing I remember after that is screaming. I remember screaming, I have no idea how long I screamed. I got up and I went in to start doing dishes, and my aunt's like, no, you need to go sit down. I'm like, no, I've got to get this stuff done before people start coming because I know people are going to start coming. And uh, she's like, no, I'll take care of it. You go sit down. And I just didn't want to sit down. I was afraid if I sat down, then, then it was going to be real. You know, as long as I was up doing something and try to get ready, that, that it couldn't have been real. I just didn't know what I was going to do without her. A bunch of the kids had gathered at the school. This was on a Sunday morning. And uh, I had my uncle take me to the school so that I could see the kids because I knew they would be all upset too. Um, it definitely helped me having, having them there. It still helps me having the ones that have stayed really close to me. It's, it's like having a part of her still with me. It's the part that I can still touch and hug and I can talk to her all I want, but she just doesn't talk back. I can't touch her. But they're, they're the part that talks back and the part that touches her. And Anna's a lot like her Amber.
uh, we all decided to go to the school and meet together as a community. Um, when I got there, um, all my I had a few of my friends that were there that were on the cheerleading squad with me, and um, they were all in hysterics. Um, I wasn't sure. I mean, I knew that we were a small town, so I was like kind of confused. And I walked up to them, and then they told me that it was it was Amber. I I was just numb. I just I just went numb and. Uh, was it real was really the question that was crossing my mind. That Monday when school came around, um, you walk into school and it was nothing like it was ever before. Um, no one was talking. No one was gathering with their friends, talking about how their weekend was. Um, everyone was just standing around. And when something like that happens, it's hard to be normal. So um, the school was really, really cooperative with everyone. Um, they placed counselors in our gymnasium. So that if you wanted to talk and you needed someone to be there, you could go and um, talk with people from the community. Um, drinking and partying was uh, kind of big at the time at our school. A lot of people were doing it. Um, after the accident, it was unheard of. Um, there was a few groups of people that would still do it, but they, were, they said the message was to learn that oh, just be safe when you're doing it. My viewpoint was you, you learned from it and you weren't gonna do it anymore, um, that you needed to stop. Amber wasn't one to do that. So when we found out that it was her, it just didn't make any sense to us. You don't have to be a regular, a partier or a drinker or whatever. I mean, it could happen at any place or any time. I started speaking at the schools a few months ago um, about drinking and driving. I think it was something that she would have wanted me to do. As long as I'm telling her story and talking about her, if I'm making an impact on just one person to save their life to where a parent doesn't have to go through that, it's, all, it's worth it. Um, I don't think any parent should have to go through it. Any sibling should have to go through it. And I know when I was a kid, there was so much of the time that I would think whatever decisions I made only affected me. And I want the kids to know that that's not true. You can say that it's only hurting me as much as you want to, but the fact of the matter is if you know, something like this happens, this is affecting not only you by losing your life, it affects your family, your friends, anybody that you have ever met, it affects. And I, I just, I want the kids to realize that the, the good choices that, you know, the choices that they, need, they make need to be good choices so that, you know, they don't, they don't have to put their parents and, and everybody through such a hard time. I'm trying to give her a huge legacy by that, by the scholarship and doing the, the schools, talks at the schools and, and anything that I can for her. I, I don't want, I want people to know who she was and I want people to, you know, know how caring of a person that she was. And I don't want what happened to her to happen to anybody else, number one. And, but I don't want it to be in vain. You know, I want what happened to her to be a purpose for that, you know, for me to speak and try to keep other kids from making the same mistakes. Kim is somebody who says they're not strong, says, no, I'm not strong. I don't know why you say that. And I think I tell Kim that she's the strongest woman I know every single day. That's true. Every day I tell you that, don't I? And she always responds with the same thing. No, I'm not. You don't know me. Come on. <laughs> Come on, I know you. <laughs> and um, I don't think you really know how strong you are until you're placed in that situation. And I know seeing Kim go through that, that if I ever had to be faced with an obstacle like she's been put through, that I, I could get through it. I could, especially with her by my side. <laughs>